Review of Ostrom's Governing the Commons. This is an evil book. I use that pejorative advisedly. It is also a basically mistaken volume, but we will get into that in a moment. Why is it a wicked publication? A description rarely applied to a dry tome in economics? This is because it contains a nasty, vicious attack on private property rights. The linchpin of a civilized order. Anything that weakens private property rights promotes barbarism. This book not only calls into question laissez-faire capitalism predicated upon private property rights, but radically undermines this system. It is a frontal attack, in other words, on the last best hope for humanity. Are human beings doomed to pursue narrow, short-term self-interests, even when it hurts our long-term self-interests and also hurts other people? Because it often seems that way, as demonstrated by the fucked up state the world is in. And on a personal level, I can also see this pattern of my narrow, short-term interests, or you know, at least short-term impulses, screwing over my long-term interests in the worst possible ways. So it's no surprise to see this reflected in human society. But is humanity perhaps capable of overcoming this and learning to cooperate for everyone's benefit? This is one of the questions that this video and the next video will attempt to answer and to do so with evidence. The most tragic thing about the tragedy of the commons is that so many people still believe it's true, and so few people have heard of the research debunking it. But before we get into all that, let's talk about a broader tragedy. Unless you live somewhere under a rock, or somewhere very deep in denial, you know that the environment is in a fucked up condition. There are innumerable ways in which this is true, and one of those ways is the fact that the natural resources that we use and depend on and that the other animals on this planet also use and depend on are being degraded and depleted and downright destroyed. Forests are vanishing. Pasture land is eroding. The water levels of lakes, rivers, and underground water sources are dropping lower and lower. The soil that grows our food is eroding to the point that it threatens the food supply. And the governments of the world, not only do they fail to respond to the crisis, they are actually partners in crime with the profit-driven companies that are responsible for causing it. So here's a question. What is the best way to cope with this problem? How can we make sure these resources exist for the long term so they can continue to be used and enjoyed by humans and by every form of life on this planet? And uh, since I think we should like set our goals a little higher than just not destroying every damn thing we depend on to survive, because that bar is just a little too low for my taste. Though, hey, it would be nice to achieve that low bar. But yeah, since we should set our goals higher than that, another question we should ask is, how can we manage and distribute these resources and all resources in a way that enables political and economic egalitarianism, so that we can abolish class divisions and live together in freedom and equality? When it comes to the question of who or what should manage the world's natural resources, most people are only aware of two options, either that natural resources should be managed by private owners, or that they should be managed by the state, you know, the government. Often these two options are combined, like when the state sets rules and regulations for using a natural resource, and then private companies and other private owners operate within those restrictions. But you hardly ever hear anyone argue for any other alternative. In fact, most people aren't even aware that there are other alternatives. And it's like, they can't think outside the box, because they don't even know that they're inside one. Help me! But what would that even look like for resources to be neither owned or managed by the state, nor owned or managed privately? Is such a thing even possible? Thankfully, it is possible. There are various possible alternatives, and one of those alternatives is what I'll be talking about in this video and the next. And that is for resources to be shared and managed as a commons. I don't even know what the hell that means. 
Basically, it's when people share a resource or resources, and then they work together to like manage their use of that resource or resources, and also to manage the area of land or the body of water or the infrastructure where they extract those resources from. This resource or like resource extraction area that people use and manage together is called a commons. And it's called a commons because it's shared, like you know, if you live in an apartment or house with roommates, probably your bedroom is your own private space. Help me! But the bathroom and the living room and the kitchen are common areas, areas that you all share in common. But when people talk about a commons, they're not talking about your shared bathroom. Interesting though it may be, they're talking about shared resources. So just real quick, I'd like to read you a definition of a commons from the International Association for the Study of the Commons, which says, The original meaning of the term commons comes from the way communities managed land that was held in common in medieval Europe. Along with this shared land, a clear set of rules was developed by the community about how it was to be used. Over time, the term commons has taken on several meanings. Most generally, it can be used to refer to a broad set of resources that are shared by many people. Traditional examples of commons include forests, fisheries, or groundwater resources. Usually it's a natural resource that is shared as a commons, but a commons can also be a human-made resource, like a bridge. Or it can be a combination of the two, like an irrigation system, because that combines the natural resource of water with human-made infrastructure of like ditches and pipes that brings that water to irrigate crops. But none of these things are necessarily a commons, right? So like if a lake is owned by a corporation or owned by an individual, that lake is private property, not a commons. And a lake owned by the government is usually not a commons either. But if use of that lake is managed by the people in the nearby community rather than managed by the government, then that lake is a commons, or it at least probably qualifies as a commons, even if it's technically owned by the government. Bottom line is that for something to qualify as a commons, it must be shared by many people and also managed by the people who use it rather than managed by the government or like private corporation or whatever. So here's another question. If our goal is to use these resources in a way that is sustainable and that does not harm the environment, how good of an option is it to manage these resources not as private property or as government property, but as a commons? This is an option that you usually don't hear about. And if you do hear about it, it's usually not good things that you're hearing. The commons, which by the way, is a term that usually does not refer to any specific commons, but more like to the very existence of the commons or just like the concept of a commons in general. Its reputation has suffered many years of slander. It has been spat on, pissed on and dragged through the mud. But eventually, researchers came along and proved that the commons is innocent of the accusations made against it. One of these researchers even won a Nobel Prize for her work exonerating the commons. But despite this, the reputation of the commons has never really recovered. And most people who've heard of the commons at all have only heard like the slanderous lies about it. And along with some other related topics, that's what I'll be focusing on in this video. I'll be correcting these distortions, which I will do by looking at the research that debunks all the false assumptions in what is known as the tragedy of the commons. But I'll also look at some grains of truth in the tragedy of the commons tale. So what is the tragedy of the commons? Later in the video, I'll explain it more, but in a nutshell, it's the idea that when economic resources are shared, those resources will inevitably be overused to the point that the resources are degraded, depleted, or destroyed. And that the way to stop this is either to privatize those resources, i.e. to stop sharing, or to put the government in charge, i.e. to submit to being coerced by an external authority. And as we'll soon see in this video, all of this has been proven to be false. However, the so-called tragedy of the commons has been used as propaganda for the belief that humans are incapable of sharing, or that we're only capable of this when we give up our power and control to rulers and elites. But why does this topic even matter? It matters because of what's at stake. The natural resources that we use for food and water and shelter and heat and energy and so much more. The environment and ecosystems that we and and all the other life forms that we share this planet with depend on for our well-being and our survival. All of this is in crisis, a crisis that threatens our existence. 
And neither the leaders of governments or the owners of private companies have been doing a great job of getting us out of this crisis, though they are doing a great job of keeping us stuck in the crisis while somehow convincing us that they've got it all under control. So uh, credit where it's due, I guess. And that's another thing we'll discuss in this video, why governments and private companies both do so badly at managing natural resources, which will also go a long way to explain why our planet is in such a dire, dangerous crisis. I'm not saying that the comments is like a magic bullet for how to solve our environmental crises, but still, if, if there is another option for like how to manage our use of resources, shouldn't we at least know about it and know the truth? rather than the slander and the lies. And there's another reason why this whole debate about the commons matters. It matters because it's tangled up not just in environmental issues, but also issues of politics and economics. It's tangled into questions of who should have control, who should have power. Must power in our society take a form where it gives political elites and economic elites the power to dominate decision-making while the rest of us are excluded? Or can power take a form that prevents these hierarchies of domination and give everyone power over decisions that impact their life? Or are ordinary people like you and me just too damn stupid, you know, just too stupid for all this autonomy? And as for the politicians and the CEOs and all the other elites who control governments and corporations, is it true that they are superior to us and that the economy and the world itself would just fall apart without their wise and benevolent command. I mean, not to give spoilers on that question, but the world is kind of falling apart already, so. And as if all that wasn't enough, this issue of the commons is also connected to the question from the start of the video. Are human beings doomed to pursue our narrow, short-term self-interest, even when it hurts our long-term self-interest and hurts each other? Or are we capable of overcoming this and learning to cooperate for everyone's benefit? These are some big important questions. So let's get into it. Say hello to Garrett Hardin, or don't, cause you know, he can't hear you. Hardin was alive for 88 years from 1915 to 2003. And somewhere along the way, he became an ecologist and wrote one of the most famous and infamous articles ever published in an academic journal, an article of big influence and big controversy. The article was called The Tragedy of the Commons. It was published in 1968 in the journal Science. And this little essay, or at least the claims that it made about the commons, soon became well-known. And not just well-known by like professors and other academic types, but also well-known by policymakers in governments around the world and in international economic institutions like the World Bank. Speaking of the World Bank, in 1989, it published a discussion paper which said the following. For some time now, Hardin's allegory of the tragedy has had remarkable currency among researchers and development practitioners. Not only has it become the dominant paradigm within which social scientists assess natural resource issues, but it appears explicitly and implicitly in the formulation of many programs and projects. And the things that this essay said about the commons were like so widely repeated in like magazines and, and news programs and various corners of the media that the idea of the tragedy of the commons and you know, even the phrase itself became something that many ordinary people are familiar with, even all these decades later. But if you're not one of those people who's heard of the tragedy of the commons, well, first of all, be thankful that your mind has not encountered this particular poison. And second of all, um, I'm sorry to spoil your good luck, but that poison is now headed your way because I will soon retell the tragedy of the commons tale. But first, meet Eleanor Ostrom. Ostrom, like Hardin, is no longer among the living, but before she abandoned those of us who are uh, blessed and burdened with life, she spent 78 years very much alive from 1933 to 2012. After a childhood in poverty, she grew up to become a political scientist and an economist. And in 1990, 22 years after Hardin published his essay, The Tragedy of the Commons, Ostrom published a book called Governing the Commons. And this is a book that brought together decades of research about the commons by Ostrom and her colleagues. It's a book that helped 
win Ostrom the Nobel Prize in economics, and it's a book that thoroughly and slam-dunkingly debunks much of what Garrett Hardin wrote about the commons. But don't take my word for it, just listen to this statement from the very place that Garrett Hardin spent 15 years of his career, the Environmental Studies Program at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Garrett Hardin was an early member of the UCSB Environmental Studies Program faculty, and many of his publications are still widely read and cited, particularly his 1968 essay titled The Tragedy of the Commons. This essay was not based on an engagement with scientific evidence and promoted an ideological agenda and conclusions that have largely been debunked by numerous scholars, including Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom. So even the place where Hardin worked as a professor admits that his essay is an embarrassment. Boom. Roasted. <laughs> And yet somehow, almost three and a half decades since Ostrom debunked Hardin's essay, the ideas and conclusions in her book, Governing the Commons, although they're, you know, like, well-respected among scholars and academics, you know, the ones who've actually looked into the research, they're like just almost completely unheard of outside of those circles. Case in point, if you search for Tragedy of the Commons on YouTube and watch like the 10 or so first search results that come up, which is something I did to research this video, these videos focus on Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons paradigm and many just don't even mention Ostrom's research at all. <coughs> and for those that do mention her, in most cases it's just like as if she's just a footnote to his work rather than the person who revolutionized our understanding of the commons. Her research, it, it made Hardin's essay pretty much obsolete, but you would just never know that from watching these videos. And on top of this, the discredited ideas about the commons from Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons essay continue to be repeated in the media, continue to be taught by many teachers and professors who should fucking know better, and continue to be believed by many ordinary people. And this isn't just like some petty complaint about credit and attention going to the wrong person, right? This is about misinformation being used as propaganda to support a fucked up political agenda. And that's exactly what happened. So because Hardin's ideas about the commons had become just so popular, they were used as justifications by governments all over the world to take land and resources that communities had shared as commons for centuries or, or even longer and then sell that land and resources off to private owners or to just put it under state control. In other words, Hardin's essay was used as justification for destroying the commons and this often resulted in dispossessing people of land and resources. Now ain't that a tragedy. It's enough to harden your heart. Turning common land and common resources into private property has been happening for centuries, but some commons continue to exist even today. And for people who want these remaining commons to be privatized, Hardin's essay has served as a useful weapon of propaganda. As Ian Angus says in his book The War Against the Commons, quote, the tragedy of the commons has been used time and again to justify stealing indigenous people's lands, privatizing health care and other social services, giving corporations tradable permits to pollute the air and water, and much more. Now, the thing is that when people use Hardin's essay to push neoliberal policies to privatize public services or industries that are run by the state, they ignore the fact that Hardin believed state control of resources could be just as effective as private control. And this is interesting because The Tragedy of the Commons was published in 1968 during the midst of the Cold War, and his arguments could, you know, if interpreted selectively, be used to support either side of that war, which shouldn't be all that astonishing since both sides are actually very similar. Both are systems where elites control economic resources for their own disproportionate benefit while everyone else is left out. Both are radically different from the commons. So, what is the tragedy of the commons? Well, when Hardin explained it in his essay, he did so by telling a story. So, I will now retell you that story in my own words. You have my undivided attention. 
Imagine a nice, peaceful village way out in the beautiful countryside of England a few hundred years in the past. This village has a big green field, a grassy pasture that is not anyone's exclusive property. Instead, it's a commons, freely available for anyone in the village to use. And so all the villagers bring their cows to graze there. So let's say there are, and I'm just making this number up, a hundred cows that are grazing in the grass of this common pasture. And it just so happens that a hundred cows is the maximum number of cows that this pasture can handle. Any more cows and the grass will be eaten faster than it can grow, and so the total amount of grass will start to decline. These 100 cows belong to 100 farmers in the village, and one of these cows belongs to a farmer named Ben. Soon after he moved to the village, Ben asked himself, Should I get myself another cow so that I can sell more milk and make more money? <laughs> That's my Ben Shapiro voice. <laughs> Well, let's see, said Ben to himself as he contemplated his own question. If another cow is added to the common pasture, there will be less grass for all the cows to eat. And if the cows are eating less, they will produce less milk, which means my cows will also produce less milk. Oh no, exclaimed Ben to himself in alarm. Don't be alarmed, Ben said, trying to reassure himself. Even though each cow will produce less milk, the decline in milk production will be very small. And meanwhile, I'll have two cows instead of just one, so I'll still end up with way more milk than I do now with only one cow. Aha! Ben exclaimed excitedly, and a smug smile spread across his face as he said, I must be very clever. To which Ben replied, Yes, you are very clever, and I'm very, very proud of you. You should be, said Ben. I'm more clever than anyone else in this village. Yes, you are, Ben said Ben. You're a very clever boy. A very, very clever boy. I'm waxed up. Booty hole waxed it down. Ah. Unfortunately, Ben was not the only one in the village who thought himself very clever. Several other farmers also had the clever idea of getting more cows, and so they did. And then several more farmers got cows after that, and then several more after that. On and on it went, until the common pasture, which was once so lush, with thick green healthy grass, became degraded. The grass now sparse and thin and sickly, and the cows also thin and sickly. The cows produced less milk, and some even died of starvation. And so now the villagers, despite having added more cows, they had less milk than ever. Okay, so that was a paraphrasing of the parable that Hardin told to explain the tragedy of the commons. Well said. I think we've all learned something here today. But just to put it really simply, all stories aside, the tragedy of the commons is that supposedly a commons will always be overused and therefore always be destroyed, just like it was in the parable with the villagers and the cows. So the assumption is that when people share a scarce resource, like the pasture that the villagers share in the parable, they will inevitably overconsume that resource. They'll use too much of it beyond what's sustainable, and so sooner or later, the resource will be degraded, depleted, or destroyed. There is a short-term benefit to overusing the commons, like with Farmer Ben when he added the extra cow and got all that extra milk. But then as the commons starts to deplete and degrade, the benefit declines and turns into a loss. Hardin assumes this will occur even if everyone can see it coming. You know, everyone can see that the commons is being overused. They can see that it is destroying the commons. But... Everyone just keeps on overusing it because each person is like, well, if I cut back on my use of the commons, it won't matter because other people are going to keep overusing it. I know Ben certainly will, the selfish prick, and who knows who else. So I just better take as much from the commons as I can while I still can because soon it's not even going to exist. So clearly this is a tragedy, the tragedy of the commons. Because the commons, aka the resource or resource extraction area that people share, is, you know, supposedly doomed to suffer a tragic demise. Here's how Hardin put it in his essay. Therein is the tragedy. Each man is locked into a system that compels him to increase his herd of cows without limit in a world that is limited. Ruin is the destination toward which all men rush, each pursuing his own best interest in a society that believes in the freedom of the commons. Freedom in a commons brings ruin to all. Now, just to be very, very clear, there is no denying that the tragedy of the commons has happened in the real world. For example, as you can see in this graph right here, 
the fish populations of the oceans have been declining for decades. Commercial fishing ships, they've been catching and killing the fish faster than those poor fish can make their little fish babies. An owner of a fishing boat knows the fish are disappearing and knows that the only way to stop that is to kill fewer fish. But he also knows that if he tries to help the situation by catching fewer fish today, that won't leave more fish for him to catch tomorrow. It's just going to leave more fish for his business competitors to catch today. So even though this is going to destroy his business in the long run, it's in his interest to catch as many fish as he can and make as much profit as he can while it's still possible for him to do so. And let's just take a moment to think of all the fish and other animals of the sea who lose their lives for capitalist profit and for human consumption, consumption that in most cases, though not all, is unnecessary and unjustified. But anyways, there are other real life examples where a common resource has been overused so much and uh, so badly that that resource was degraded, depleted, and even destroyed. And that can make it seem like the tragedy of the commons thesis is correct, but that is not the case. What Hardin describes in his essay is true of commons that are ungoverned, right? But it does not apply to most commons that are governed. And by governed, I don't mean that the government has been put in charge. Thank God. I'm talking about self-governance, you know, like, like the people who use the commons are the ones who govern it themselves. So they get together and they figure out how to cooperate to use the commons in a sustainable way so that the commons is not degraded or ruined, but can continue to survive and thrive. So just for like a very, very brief and simple example, here's a description of common pasture lands in villages in Southeast Asia. And uh, this description, it comes from a book called Seeing Like a State by James C. Scott. Rights to graze fowl and livestock on pasture land held in common by the village is extended to all local families, but, the number of animals that can be grazed is restricted according to family size, especially in dry years when forage is scarce. So there you go. Just a few simple rules that are put in place by the community to make sure that their common pasture land is used sustainably and fairly. So in this case, the rules restrict how many animals each family is allowed to graze. And then those restrictions are tightened during years of dry weather. So for commons like these, you know, commons that are actually governed by the people who use them, Hardin's essay paints a completely false picture. He speaks about the commons as if they're all ungoverned, as if like, being ungoverned is some sort of like essential feature of the commons. It's as if the commons is just like a synonym for something that anyone and everyone can use without limits or rules. And like, that is just absolutely not the case. Now let's get back to our friend, Eleanor Ostrom. She was 35 years old when Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons essay came out. And when she read that shit, she was like, wait a minute, is this for real? Is it true that when people share a resource that they inevitably overuse it and cause its demise? And so she decided to find out. And the way she found out was by making up a parable of her own. Just kidding. Um, Ostrom, unlike Hardin, believed that theory should be grounded in real world empirical evidence and research rather than made up stories. Boom, roasted. And so Ostrom traveled around the world to communities that have a commons, communities where people share a resource. These communities were in various countries and continents, and the resources that they shared in common were of various types. In some places, their commons was pasture land. In other places, it was forests, fishing territory, or water aquifers, or irrigation systems, and so on and so on. In these communities, Ostrom and her research partners spent time observing and documented how things actually played out in real life. They saw case after case after case where the commons just does not lead to tragedy at all. Instead, they saw people working together to manage a shared resource in a way that is sustainable. And here's a quote about that from an article by Ostrom and four of her colleagues. Uh, but you will get to hear it in Ostrom's voice. Or at least, uh, as I did earlier with the quote from Hardin, it's the AI clone deepfake version of her voice. Spooky. 
Although tragedies have undoubtedly occurred, it is also obvious that for thousands of years people have self-organized to manage common pool resources, and users often do devise long-term, sustainable institutions for governing these resources. And by the way, Ostrom was far from the first person to go out into the world and study the commons, and she said so herself. An extraordinarily rich case study literature already existed, written by field researchers who had invested years of effort in obtaining detailed information. So just to give you an idea of like how much research had been done on the commons, even before Ostrom stepped onto the scene, um, at Indiana University, some of Ostrom's colleagues, they started to collect citations of research studies that had been done on the commons. And by 1989, they had already gathered nearly 5,000 of them. Ugh, it's too bad that Hardin never uh, bothered to look at any of this research before he wrote his essay. But never mind. As the years went by, Ostrom shared her research on the commons by publishing dozens of articles in academic journals. Until finally, in 1990, she summarized her most important findings in a book, Governing the Commons, The Evolution of Institutions for Collective Action. The book received very enthusiastic critical acclaim, and even all these years later, it's still considered the best, or at least one of the best books, that you can read on the subject of the commons. So it's really no wonder that in 2009, in honor of her lifetime of ground baking, ground baking? <laughs> She's not baking the ground. <laughs> She's breaking the ground. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economic Sciences. Okay, so at this point, it's probably time to explain how governance of the commons actually works. And uh, that means we, first of all, should explain who is actually doing the governing. So we know that the people who use a commons are also the ones who govern it. And because a commons is a shared resource or a shared area of land or body of water or infrastructure where those resources are extracted from, the people who use a commons can be called resource users. According to the cases that Eleanor Ostrom presents in her book, these resource users can be divided into three categories. Category one is subsistence. So these are people who use the common resource just for subsistence, you know, just to like meet their own needs. So like the peasants in the mountains of Nepal who gather firewood from the forests to cook their food and heat their homes. People in this category almost always live in remote communities. They're often like peasants or indigenous people who live a pretty basic subsistence lifestyle and have very little or even no interaction with the market economy. Category two, self-employed. Resource users can also be people who take resources from the commons for commercial purposes. So an example of that is in the coastal town of Alania, Turkey. Their commons is an area of water just right on the coast that they use to catch fish that they sell in the market. Another example is in Garrett Hardin's parable, right? Because the villagers, they use the common pasture land to feed their cows and then that allows the cows to be healthy enough and alive enough to create milk, and then the villagers sell that milk. But even though people like this are using the commons to make money, uh, they're not really what you would call business owners, right? They're, they're self-employed individuals, and they're usually just making a small or modest income. But then there's category three, which is commercial or state institutions. According to Eleanor Ostrom, resource users of a commons can also include businesses or even large corporations. So like logging companies, for example, that cut down forests to sell for timber. And again, according to Ostrom, uh, the resource users of a commons can also be government institutions or government owned companies. Uh, for example, a water utility company that uses a lake to provide water for every house and building in the city. Now, I actually have like a really big problem with this third category, and I think you should too. We should all have a problem with it. So in Ostrom's book, Governing the Commons, most of the examples of commons involve resource users in categories one and two, most of them. However, the book also has an example of a commons with resource users in category number three, uh, businesses and government institutions, and they're all like sharing use of water reservoirs in Southern California. And I was like, really disappointed in Ostrom for including this case study in her book. 
Like I just I just really don't think it belongs in the book. I don't think it really counts as a commons. And I'll explain why. One of the reasons I was eager to make a video on the commons is because it provides real life examples of economic self-governance. And it, it, it just doesn't count as real self-governance if that governing is done by the bureaucracies of businesses and governments. You know, like real self-governance, it, it gives people actual decision-making power over the political and economic and social occurrences that affect them, right? It involves people having power and autonomy to run their own lives, you know? It, 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 it doesn't involve giving more power and autonomy to, <laughs> to the institutions that are to blame for why people have so little power and autonomy to begin with, <laughs> you know? Like, for fuck's sake. Eleanor, I love you, but you let me down. You broke my heart, and I don't know if I'll ever get over it. And just to be clear, my issue with state institutions or business institutions participating in the governance of a commons has nothing to do with the scale or size of the institutions. So it's not that they're too big, and it's also like not a problem with them being institutions per se. You know, I have no problem with either of those things. My issue with these institutions is that they're basically organized as a dominance hierarchy, right? So with those at the top having power over those below and with the workers in these institutions being exploited. And also that these institutions are an integral part of a system that allows elites to be the ones who make decisions for society while everyone else is not only excluded from making those decisions, but is also forced, for better or for worse, to face the consequences of the decisions that those elites make. In other words, they have the power and everyone else does not. But if we had a different type of society with different political system, different economic system that was actually egalitarian, then instead of businesses and state institutions, we could have like some sort of functionally equivalent institutions, but that would actually be egalitarian. So instead of businesses, there would be enterprises that were focused on economic production, but they would be self-managed by the workers using egalitarian, non-hierarchical, and bottom-up practices, and hopefully also operating outside of any sort of pursuit of profit. And instead of state institutions, there might be, for example, like councils of delegates that are connected to like a federation of autonomous communities with each community having like its own local self-governance structure or something like that. You know, some sort of like anarchist type of structure that there's many different ways it can be achieved. And I'm not like trying to lay it all out in this video. So in a world like this, I'm sure that there would be many, many cases where it would be totally appropriate for these types of institutions to be involved in governing or managing a commons. But anyways, we are getting quite a bit sidetracked here. We still need to answer the question of how does governance of the commons actually work? Well, no two operate in the exact same way. Each one is adapted to local conditions, local customs, but still, there are some basic similarities. So here is the very quick, very simplified, and very general version of how a commons is governed. So basically, the people who share a common resource, they get together in a meeting, and they talk, and they say to each other, look, if we don't limit our use of the commons of this resource that we all share, it's going to hurt us all. So let's not be stupid. Let's create and agree on rules to prevent this. Makes sense. And that's what they do. They create rules to limit how much of the resource they can use, like limits on how much water each person can take from the river or how many trees that they can take from the forest. Or to use the old familiar example, how many cows each person can graze in a pasture. And if necessary, they also make rules requiring everyone to make a fair and equitable contribution to maintenance, you know, keeping the commons in good and usable condition. So, for example, if the common resource is a stream that feeds into an irrigation system, 
it may be the case that throughout the year, trees are going to like fall into the stream and block the flow of the water, or at least like slow the flow down. And that means that every so often, like maybe once a year or after a bad storm, people need to go down to the stream and clear the logs away so that the water can flow freely. So obviously this is a situation where you don't want any free riders. You don't want people just like letting other people do the work while they just sit back, relax, and get all the benefits of the resource without having to do any work themselves. So the people who share this stream as a commons, they can create rules to make sure that everybody chips in to get this task done, either by actually doing a share of the work themselves, so like resource users going down to the stream and moving the logs, or they can chip in by paying a share of the cost to hire other people to move the logs. So in general, rules of the commons commons fall into two categories. One is rules that limit people's use of the commons, and the other is rules that prevent the free rider problem by requiring people to contribute to the maintenance of the commons. So altogether, these rules are designed to make sure that use of the commons is sustainable, and usually also to make sure that use of the commons is equitable, so that everybody gets an equitable share of the resources, and also that everyone is contributing equitably to maintaining the resources. This egalitarian tendency is very common, get it, when it comes to the commons. After all, people are much more likely to follow rules that they believe are fair, and it won't feel fair if some people are getting extra benefits or extra burdens. This is explained by Eleanor Ostrom, and in this quote, she is giving a hypothetical example of a common pasture or meadow that is shared by two cattle herders. Any proposal made by one herder that did not involve an equal sharing of the carrying capacity and of enforcement costs would be vetoed by the other herder in their negotiations. Consequently, the only feasible agreement is for herders to share equally the sustainable yield levels of the meadow and the costs of enforcing their agreement. So this is an important thing to remember about the commons, their tendency to be egalitarian. The resources are shared equitably by the resource users, and the costs are shared equitably too. It's an equal sharing of the benefits and burdens. And this tendency to share things equally should be of no surprise. It's the expected outcome that will occur when power over the decision-making process is also shared equally. Because it's only when decision-making power is not equal, when some have more power than others, that those with more power are able to give themselves more resources. So the people who use a commons are the ones who create their own rules. They do this in meetings where they talk and brainstorm and debate and argue about what rules they think will be best. And then finally, they also need to agree to those rules. Hopefully they can come to a consensus where everyone is happy with the rules, but they might also vote on each rule and just go with a majority decision. And through the same process of talking and problem solving and debate, the people who use the commons also create procedures for monitoring each other's compliance with the rules. And they create penalties for breaking rules, such as making the rule breaker pay a fine. And after implementing all these rules and procedures and penalties, they just get on with their lives. You know, they get on with using the commons and with implementing all the things that they agreed to. Various economists and academics have compared people's attempts to govern a commons to the prisoner's dilemma, but this comparison does not make sense. The prisoners in that story, they cannot cooperate and they cannot cooperate because they cannot communicate and they cannot communicate because they're locked in separate jail cells. But most people in the real world are not locked in a jail cell. And this is what makes Hardin's tragedy of the common story so dumb. He assumes that people who are living in the same village can't or won't or don't talk to each other, which just really doesn't make sense. I mean, these people are neighbors in like a tiny village. You're telling me they never speak? Maybe the real tragedy of the commons is the undiagnosed extreme social anxiety that all these people apparently had that they can't even say a fucking word to each other. Thankfully, in the real world, people are able to communicate with each other, and that makes it possible for them to prevent the tragedy of the commons by coming up with and agreeing to a set of rules. 
sometimes the number of people sharing a commons is so big that not everyone can fit in the same meeting. You know, it's not practical or even possible. And many people believe that this is the point where there's too many people to fit in one meeting, that self-governance is no longer possible. This is the point where everyone's just gonna have to accept that only a small percent of them can have power. And then the rest of them are just gonna have to like stand aside and weep or wilt or fucking wank off or whatever the fuck it is that people do when they don't have decision-making power over the things that affect their lives. But thankfully, this is not the case. When there are too many people to fit in one meeting, there are different ways to handle this. Uh, one of which is that the resource users, so you know, like the people who use the commons, can just divide themselves up into several groups, and then each of those groups will have its own meeting. And then each of these groups also chooses one or more people from that group to be a delegate for that group, and then all of the delegates go off and have their own meeting. And then at this meeting, all of the delegates tell each other what was said at the group meeting that they originally came from. So it's like all the different delegates from all the different meetings are like telling each other what happened at each of those meetings. And that gives them basically a holistic picture of everything that everyone said. So they tell each other all of the relevant issues and problems that each group discussed, and also all of the ideas for rules and policies and solutions as well. And so they share all this information with each other, and from there they can use this information to like guide them in coming up with ideas for rules and policies for the commons. And ideally, these ideas for rules and policies, they're just going to be proposals, right, that, that are proposed to the various groups of resource users. So like next time the resource users have their group meetings, these ideas for rules and policies will be proposed to them and then they can decide whether they accept or reject those policies. So that way, the ultimate decision-making authority is not gonna be the delegates, it's gonna be the resource users as a whole. This is all to try to avoid creating too much of a hierarchy or inequality in decision-making power. So that is how resource users can self-govern a commons in a way that is egalitarian, even when there are hundreds or, or even thousands of people governing that commons. And this method is also suitable for even bigger populations. All it takes is to just like create like layers or repeating patterns of what I described. And I know that really deserves a more in-depth explanation, but this is something that I'm gonna get into in the next video. And this is gonna include an example of tens of thousands of farmers in Sri Lanka who, uh, despite there being, as I said, tens of thousands of them, they all share and co-manage a common irrigation system. Ideally, and this does happen in some cases, the resource users who govern a commons will consult professionals and experts who will help them create a resource management plan. For example, if various communities are sharing an underground water supply, they need to know how much water they can take without causing the water level to drop, otherwise they're just gonna run out of water. And calculating what a sustainable water extraction rate is, is something that requires the research and expertise of professionals. But yeah, so this is actually a really, really important point about the commons. You know, yes, it is the resource users or the people who use the commons that are going to be the ones governing it, but they don't have to do it alone. They can do it with help and guidance from professionals and people with relevant expertise. And actually, I think this is ideal or even crucial for this to be a part of how a commons is governed. Like the people who've spent years of their life learning about water reservoirs or lakes or forests or whatever it may be, they should absolutely be involved in managing them. However, their involvement, it should be a genuine partnership or collaboration with the community or communities that are using these resources. But yeah, can you imagine how crazy it would be if like big decisions that impact the environment were made without consulting experts and then following their guidance? That would be really stupid. Good thing that governments and corporations and other mainstream political and economic institutions don't do anything as dumb as that, right? Help me. Please help me. Help me. Help me. Help me. Help me.
But anyways, there you go. That was a very simplified explanation of how people self-govern their commons and how they keep their shared resource in a good condition from one generation to the next. And they do this without a state forcing laws and regulations on them and without a manager dictating directions and orders at them. Instead, they just do it through their own voluntary organizations where they just figure things out for themselves. One of the things that I find impressive about the examples of commons that Ostrom gives in her book is the length of time that these commons have existed for. Each one of them is more than a hundred years old, and there's even an example of a commons that is over a thousand years old. These are institutions of self-governance that have stood the test of time. As Ostrom put it, The youngest set of institutions to be analyzed in this chapter is already more than 100 years old. The history of the oldest system to be examined exceeds 1,000 years. The institutions discussed in this chapter have survived droughts, floods, wars, pestilence, and major economic and political changes. I think that's pretty cool, but you know what isn't pretty cool? Hardin's thesis still being spread all these years later. A classic problem called the tragedy of the commons. Garrett Hardin revived the concept to describe what happens when many individuals all share a limited resource. Hardin argued that these situations pit short-term self-interest against the common good, and they end badly for everyone. When you hear Hardin's story of the tragedy of the commons, it sounds quite convincing, but it's just a story. Economists have tried to validate this story with game theory, but their theories don't match reality in most cases. To quote an article published in the Journal of Institutional Economics, theorists tend to predict tragic outcomes for all instances of the commons because they employ models and theories that foreclose other possibilities. And this is a problem because, quote, the model's presumptions did not really fit very many common pool resource situations found in the world. In other words, the tragedy of the commons does not match reality in most cases because it's based primarily on theories and assumptions and not based on actual research of actual commons used by actual people in the actual real world. But despite all of that, Hardin managed to convince a lot of people that the commons is just a disaster waiting to happen and therefore it should not exist. Okay, so fuck the commons. Cancel it, abolish it, block it. That's Hardin's attitude. But then, if all commons are going to be abolished, what should take its place? Ten years after publishing The Tragedy of the Commons, Hardin published another essay where he suggested two possible alternatives to the commons, or two solutions to the commons. Solution one is to divide the commons into smaller portions of private property, and solution two is to assign a manager that will have total power to control and manage the resource that was once held in common. Or to quote Hardin directly, What is to be done? Only one thing will suffice. We must renounce the system of the commons. The group can agree either to divide up the commons into private property, case one, or to appoint a manager for the common property, case two. And although Hardin did not specifically mention state control in this essay, this second solution is usually interpreted to mean exactly that for the commons to be put under top-down management by the state slash government. And in his other writings, Hardin does recommend state control as a way to prevent the tragedy of the commons. And what about Eleanor Ostrom? What did she think about private owners and the state taking control of land and resources that were once shared as a commons? At the very start of this video, I read an excerpt from a book review of Eleanor Ostrom's book, Governing the Commons. You know, the one that said, This is an evil book. And also said that the book is a nasty, vicious attack on private property rights. The author also claims that Ostrom's book not only calls into question laissez-faire capitalism, predicated upon private property rights, but radically undermines this system. And of course, who could forget that he says the book is a frontal attack on the last best hope for humanity? So that very same excerpt of that very same essay, I recorded myself reading it to my friend and also recorded reading him an excerpt of the script for this very video 
that you're currently watching. It's an excerpt where I respond to the claims that this book review makes of Ostrom's book. And I'd like to share that recording with you, because, I don't know, I like it. It's rough, it's raw, it's real, it's written with mispronunciations of Ayn Rand. So, here it is. On the last best hope for humanity. My God. <clears throat> The author of that quote is Walter E. Block, an, Ameri an American economist whose love of... Oh, that's a real guy. Yeah. A real guy. So yeah. That sorry, I thought that was like... You thought that was made up? <laughs> yeah. I know. It what does, a lunatic. It sounds made up, doesn't it? It sounds it like really a parody. Sounds made up. That's hilarious. Oh, yeah. That's a real person. Yep, a real person. Cool. Uh, named Walter E. Block, who is, who is a real person and not a parody author. He's an American economist. Of course. Of course. Whose love of unregulated capitalism is surpassed only by his love of being a moron. I mean, he, was, he was just going down on Ayn Rand. I mean, he was writing this. He was going on down on Ayn Rand as he wrote this. 100% was. <laughs> anyway. In fact, rumor has it he was going down on Ayn Rand as he wrote those very words I just yes. read. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Block would have you believe that Ostrom is some sort of Antifa super soldier and that every page of her book is like a flaming Molotov cocktail flung at the heart of private property, a boot kicking at the balls of capitalism, a literal, and remember, this is a quote, frontal attack on the last best hope for humanity. Wow. Jesus Atlas shrugged Christ. That is some serious <laughs> sky high level delusion right there. Yeah. Walter E. Block is greatly, greatly overstating the threat that Ostrom's book poses to private property. It's really, truly not a threat. And in fact, Ostrom isn't even opposed to private property. She even explicitly says well, this. Yeah, which, which is unfortunate. Uh, she even explicitly says this in the book that Block is so damn terrified of centralization or privatization will sometimes work. Um, I'm arguing that they are not the only solutions of successful systems and that many times individuals come together and create a common property regime and that many common property regimes are also successful. I don't know what made this guy so paranoidly delusional. Maybe Anne Rand's pussy has like some sort of... <laughs> High THC meth <laughs> secretion. Cocaine and methamphetamine. <laughs> yeah. What what other drugs make you paranoid? THC. Bath salts. Bath salts. Yeah. That's fun. But anyways, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, she's a moderate, right? So she never argued that private ownership of economic resources is bad. She never argued that the state is bad, and she never argued that we should create a world where these things do not exist. However, her research does show that human beings are able to manage their local economic resources without private ownership and without a state. She pointed out that it is a proven fact, proven by thousands of research studies and innumerable examples, that people are able to manage their shared use of scarce and economically valuable resources. And they can do this without putting those resources under private or state control. Now, I really don't want to exaggerate the implications of this, so I'm not saying that Ostrom's research or any research on the commons is like in and of itself enough to prove that we are capable of managing an entire complex global economy without any states and without turning economic resources into private property. However, her research and other research on the commons, it does help add to the pile of evidence and therefore strengthen the case that a world like this is possible. And when you combine it with all the other available evidence, I believe that a strong case can be made, but you know, we're just trying to have one focus in this video, which is the comments. So I'm not going to get into all that other stuff, but you know, subscribe to this channel, check out some of my other videos or check the video description for some other learning resources. So to sum this all up, Ostrom's research can be used to help make a case for an anti-capitalist and anti-state position, but she never intended for her work to be used 
for that purpose. But that ain't going to stop me. Garrett Hardin and those who follow his line of thought say that land and forests and lakes and natural resources in general should be owned and controlled by private owners or by the state or by some mix of the two. And they also say that this is necessary, uh, not sufficient in itself, but like a necessary foundation in order to protect nature from overuse and from ruin. And this is also the usual assumption that is heard in the media and from politicians and from most economists. But there are several reasons why this point of view is wrong, why private owners and why states are not so much potential protectors of nature as they are what nature needs protecting from. And that's what we're going to talk about next. But first, I have a little treat for you. Ladies and gentlemen and gentlefolk of all types, what follows are some YouTube comments, all of them tragically misguided, from videos on Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons. In other words, may I present to you the Tragedy of the Commons. Communism in a nutshell. The very essence of communism. That's socialism for you. Capitalism is our best solution. A privatized rainforest could be protected by its private owners. It has been proven to be 100% real. Collectivization of farmlands almost always leads to famine. And no, people do not talk to each other to collectively manage their resources. They talk to each other to divide the resources and land and give everyone ownership over a small piece of land. The commons is the tragedy. Thanks. Very insightful. Oh, and we'll add in one Reddit comment, just because why the hell not? Creating a commons incentivizes people to fuck the commons up. Solution, don't have a commons, or use guns to make people not fuck up the commons. <laughs> um, okay, uh, that's one way to do it, I guess. Okay, so as promised, we're going to talk about why Hardin's so-called solutions to the so-called tragedy of the commons are not so good. Let's start by examining privatization, so resources that used to be a commons coming under private ownership and control. In Hardin's tale of the tragedy of the commons, the common pasture land is being overgrazed because there are too many cows. Hardin says that one solution is to divide the common pasture land into a bunch of separate plots of land, and then each plot of land would be purchased by a villager. If this happens, then nobody is going to want more cows than their little plot of land can handle. If someone did buy extra cows, these cows could only graze on this person's own land, and the consequences of overgrazing would only fall on that one individual and on his or her poor, starving cows. So, problem solved, right? Mm. Not necessarily. There are many possible things that could go wrong. For starters, privatizing a commons does not necessarily mean that the commons is going to be split up into small pieces and each piece owned by one person. Instead, it can mean dividing the commons into just a few big pieces or even just keeping it totally undivided but still putting it under private ownership. And who can afford to buy such a large property? Well, it's not local resource users, or peasants, or even small business owners. The ones that can afford such things are large companies, the soulless demonic corporations that would drown your grandmother in a shallow pool of baby's blood if it made them an extra dollar. In fact, I believe that Apple is coming up with that as their new slogan. And speaking of making an extra dollar, feel free to donate to me on Patreon or PayPal or Coffee, Ko-Fi, whatever, as I rather not resort to drowning grandmothers in baby's blood. But hey, I'm gonna do what I gotta do to get by, so. In fact, tell your grandma to donate to me too, or I'm gonna come for her. 
So using Hardin's parable as like a hypothetical example, let's say that the entire pasture land, rather than being divided up into individually owned plots of land, the entire thing is purchased by a company that actually owns hundreds of pasture lands. And now that this company owns this pasture too, it forbids the villagers from using the land. It paves over half the land to build a shopping mall. It uses the other half of the land to build a factory farm. And then it hires some of the villagers back as minimum wage employees. And they all lived crappily ever after the end. But people who defend privatization as a solution to the tragedy of the commons, they say that it just really doesn't matter if the resource is owned by many individuals in many small properties, or if the resource is owned by just one company as one giant property. Because they say that either way, a private owner is going to make sure that the resource that they own will not be overused. If it is overused, then the resource that they own will degrade and deplete, and then their property is going to decline in its value. And they don't want that. So according to this perspective, the profit motive is what is going to guide a private owner to conserve the resource that they own and to use it sustainably. However, this is only going to be true if using that resource sustainably is actually going to maximize profit and in particular short-term profit. And unfortunately, that is often not the case. Take farmers, for example. They own the land that they farm on. So in theory, they should be using that land in a sustainable way, right? In a way that doesn't degrade the quality or health of the soil, because to do so would cause their property to lose value. That's what the theory tells us, but reality tells us something different. Don't you just hate when that happens? A research report published in 2021 by the Food and Agricultural Organization says that 34% of agricultural land, that's one goddamn third of it, is suffering from soil degradation, and specifically soil degradation that is being caused by humans. And soil degradation is a really, really, really serious problem because as soil degrades, the ability of that soil to grow food declines. So crop yields shrink, the food supply goes down, food prices go up, cost of living goes up, hunger and starvation goes up. All these things can result from soil degradation and will unless the problem is fixed, because until it is fixed, it will continue to get worse. And a major reason why soil degradation on farmland is so common is because mainstream farming practices are just really, really, really bad for the soil and also really bad for the ecosystem. But it's profitable, at least in the short term. And that's why it's done. Even Garrett Hardin, our infamous author of The Tragedy of the Commons, admitted that private companies have tendencies that are ecologically destructive. Here's what he said, and this is quoting from his essay in the book, Wildlife and America. We might mistakenly deduce that under private enterprise, the goal of conservation will always be well served. Alas, this is not necessarily so. Suppose a man owns a forest which, if harvested on a sustained yield basis, would provide income ad infinitum. Suppose further that soil conditions are such, as in the tropics, that if clear-cut, the land would thereby be rendered useless for future forest growth. He could, however, invest the lump sum realized from the clear-cutting at the going rate of interest. How does the owner decide his cutting policy? Guided purely by economics, he must clear-cut if the after-tax return on the lump sum is greater than the return, after expenses and taxes, on the sustained yield operation. And even if the interest rate is extremely low, the same problem still applies because you can still get a pretty high rate of return from investing in the stock market or other investments. And that's exactly why Land Magazine published an article with advice for forest owners. Uh, I mean, that itself is like a really gross concept, you know, that, that a forest can be owned. But anyways, the article is called Maximizing the Value of Timber Income on Your Property. And here's what it says. When looking to optimize for financial returns from your current forest, ignoring all else, it is important to treat your timber as an asset. 
When considering the value of an asset that has future expected returns, some calculations can be done in order to compare your potential earnings to other available current investments, stocks, bonds, etc. This is a common form of financial comparison known as discounting that allows you to create a rate of return to compare any appreciating asset with unrealized gains. If the rate of return you're receiving from the future gains on your timber is ever lower than another established current investment, then you know it is time to harvest. Say that over the next 10 years, you will be essentially receiving a 6% return. If you know that the stock market returns about 7% over the same period, harvesting now would be the better decision from a financial standpoint. <sighs> In other words, rather than let forests grow long enough to let trees reach an advanced age and size, which is what's better for the environment, better for wildlife, and better for sequestering carbon and combating climate change. Instead, the forest owner should cut the forest down any time the estimated earnings from allowing future growth are less than the estimated earnings from cutting it now, selling the timber, and investing that money into the stock market or some shit like that. Great. If you want to see how the free market really works, this is the place to come. And this focus on short-term profit also fucks with like the whole logging industry. So most logging companies, they cut down forests on short rotations, which is like, you know, every few decades. And they do this even though cutting them down on longer rotations about every 80 to 100 years would have several benefits. And these benefits are described in an article by the Sightline Institute. So for starters, having longer rotations in how often a forest is logged would fight climate change by removing more carbon from the atmosphere. And it would also reduce the severity of forest fires, and it would provide better conditions for wildlife. And along with these environmental benefits, it would also have economic benefits by producing more timber, as well as higher quality and more valuable lumber. But despite all these benefits, logging companies usually cut down trees on short rotations, because this provides higher short-term profits. As the article from the Sightline Institute says, long rotations produce sustained value over time, but not the short-term return on investment sought especially by investor-driven companies. The opportunity cost of not cashing in the trees now and investing in lucrative land deals or Tesla stock means that income received in the future from long rotations is essentially worth less than the same income received today. Anyways, getting back to Garrett Hardin and his essay in Wildlife America, he then goes on to give another example of private companies laying waste to natural resources. And this time he talks about how natural resources in poor, low-income countries are extra vulnerable to being overused and destroyed. Hardin starts off this conversation by saying, It is necessarily true that money is worth more in a poor country than it is in a rich one. It's scarcer. So what he's referring to here is the differences in purchasing power between the currency in low income and high income countries. One American dollar can obviously buy way more in like Bangladesh than it can in the United States. Consequently, the rich country can save its own resources by drawing on the comparable ones of the poor. No conquest, no army of occupation, no political controls are needed. Wholly open negotiations in a world in which money has different real values in different parts of the world can bring about the complete ruin of natural resources in the poorest parts. The system may appear to be one of private national enterprise. In fact, the significantly different value of money in different parts has the effect of allowing the rich to help themselves to the commons of the poor. The threat of irresponsible ruin is no idle one. This is what is developing right now in the great tropical hardwood forests in poor countries. Starved for aesthetically desirable hardwoods, the rich countries painlessly offer sums of money that are irresistible to the poor. 
So these are just a few examples of how the profit motive and private companies can cause the destruction of natural resources and the environment, and why turning land and forests and water and other parts of nature into private property can be a driving force for ruin. In a capitalist system or any profit-driven economic system, the value of property is based on its financial value or its market value. It's not based on the actual real value that it provides by being useful to human beings or to the other life forms on this planet. So if a property owner can maximize their profit by destroying their own property, they not only have the right to do so, they have an economic incentive to do exactly that, no matter who else is harmed in the process. You know, much like drowning your grandma in a shallow pool of baby's blood, if a business can profit off that, they're going to do it. So when nature is turned into property, that can just make it even more vulnerable to being destroyed. And this, by the way, is just one of the reasons why I think that humanity really, really needs to ditch the current economic system of capitalism and replace it with something completely new and different. And if that's a topic that interests you, feel free to check out my video, Post-Capitalism, a detailed look at how it could work. Link below in the video description. While we're still on the topic of private property and private profit and how this causes the over-exploitation and depletion of resources, I just want to like apply this to Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons parable just for a moment. So in this parable, although the pasture land is common property, the cows are private property. And this is why each farmer is so tempted to add yet another cow. It's because they get to monopolize all the profit that each cow brings. This temptation would just not exist if the cows were also common property, because in that case, the profit from the cows would be shared by the entire village. Though, honestly, the cows should just not be property at all. Not common property, not private property. No animal should be property. All animals deserve to be free. But anyways, the point is that Hardin's tragedy of the commons tale could just as easily have been called the tragedy of private property. Earlier I mentioned that Hardin's tragedy of the commons essay has been used as propaganda to provide a pretense of justification for policies that turn common resources into private property. It's a point that deserves some more attention, and so I'm going to read you an excerpt from an essay by a Princeton University professor named Rob Nixon, because I think he discusses this topic clearly and concisely. So, here it is. Hardin's thinking resonated in particular with policymakers at the International Monetary Fund, at the World Bank, and at conservative think tanks and kindred neoliberal institutions advocating so-called trickle-down economics, structural adjustment, austerity measures, government shrinkage, and the privatization of resources. Hardin's pithy essay title and succinct parable have helped vindicate a neoliberal rescue narrative whereby privatization through enclosure, dispossession, and resource capture is deemed necessary for averting tragedy. Neoliberals have aligned themselves with the notion of an innately tragic commons, in part because it is consistent with their hostility to shared goods. Because Hardin's history-stripping tragic parable represents the commons as inherently lawless, neoliberals could use his essay's title to bolster their arguments for the closure, i.e. privatization of the commons, as an absolute good. However, contra neoliberalism's core tenets, Hardin also argued for an intensified state role in imposing taxes and regulations. In order, he insisted, to prevent corporations from polluting recklessly, privatizing profits while socializing health and environmental costs. In lauding Hardin's economic vision, neoliberals suppress the part of his argument in which he rails against unchecked growth on a finite planet. Hardin slowly became aware that his essay's charismatic title encouraged the kind of misapprehension practiced by neoliberals. He returned again and again in essays, books, and interviews to correct what he saw as a pervasive misreading of his argument. In one essay, The Tragedy of the Unmanaged Commons, Hardin conceded that, quote, A managed commons, though it may have other defects, 
is not automatically subject to the tragic fate of the unmanaged commons. End quote. He lamented omitting from the title of his original essay some qualifying adjective like unmanaged or unregulated. Had he shown the foresight to include such a qualifier, it would surely have tempered his essay's neoliberal appeal, its afterlife through brisk illusion as a neoliberal meme. Hardin was not alone in trying to complicate the crude causal link between the commons and tragedy that his essay title established. Scholars from a dozen disciplines have sought to rein in his runaway phrase. No one has done more for the concerted effort to decouple tragedy from the commons than the Indiana University political scientist Eleanor Ostrom. However, no arguments that the later somewhat rueful Hardin or Ostrom or Hardin's interdisciplinary critics have mounted can fully undo the tenacious public power that the tragedy of the commons continues to exert. Five small words that draw together into a reductive, conveniently portable phrase, a set of formulaic assumptions. And now that we're back on the topic of Hardin's essay, I think that before we move on to discussing state control of natural resources, this is a good time to discuss and debunk the source of inspiration behind Garrett Hardin's Tragedy of the Commons Parable, which is a pamphlet written back in 1833 by a British uh, economist named William Forster Lloyd. And in this pamphlet, Lloyd asks the following. Why are the cattle on the common so beauty and stunted i'm trying to defend that here <laughs> i don't know if it's working but <laughs> did you like it i don't know i love it okay why are the cattle on a common so beauty and stunted why is the common itself so bare worn and crop so different there from the adjoining enclosures okay <laughs> Thank you. That was excellent. Most excellent. Lloyd then goes on to answer his own questions, and he does this by giving an explanation that is basically identical to Hardin's tragedy of the commons. So first of all, we don't actually know if William Forster Lloyd was even correct when he said that the cows who grazed on common property were skinny, small, and stunted compared to the cows who grazed on private property. Lloyd doesn't even provide any statistic or like a single shred of evidence to back up his claim. And that makes that claim eh, pretty sus. And second of all, even if this claim is correct, there are other possible explanations that have nothing to do with the tragedy of the commons. One likely explanation for skinny cows on common pasture land is that the amount of common pasture land that was available in England just just wasn't enough for all the peasants who depended on it. So like the average amount of land per landowner was just like a hell of a lot more than the average amount of common land per person who depended on the commons. And who do you think is gonna have an easier time keeping their cows well fed and an easier time not overgrazing the land. Is it gonna be a broke-ass peasant who shares a small common pasture with all the other peasants in the village? Or is it gonna be the wealthy lord who owns the fucking village and all the other land around it? I wonder! And just to make matters worse, in 1833, when Lloyd published his pamphlet, the amount of common land available in England was actually way less than it was during the Middle Ages. And that was due to the Enclosure Acts, which for centuries had been taking common land away from the peasants and turning it into the private property of lords and aristocrats, which is something I talked about in my previous video. So in 1833, Peasants who relied on the commons were dealing with a serious scarcity of land. Now, Lloyd, he must have known all this, right? There's no way he couldn't have known all this. So the fact that he, this just like did not even enter his analysis at all when he was trying to explain like, oh, why are cows so skinny on the common land? Why are common pastures so overgrazed? And instead he just leaps right into blaming the tragedy of the commons. This really makes me wonder, like, was this guy being purposely dishonest just to push his own political agenda? Or was he actually that dumb? 
It's a question that I have about so many people, purposely dishonest or just that dumb? It's the perennial question. Ah. And then over a century later, along comes Garrett Hardin just totally embracing Lloyd's theory without even a hint of critical thinking. And for that, he achieved considerable fame and was widely hailed as like a brilliant thought leader. And his thesis was leveraged as an, an ideological weapon in the drive towards privatization. Isn't that just so fucking great? Just the stupidity after stupidity after stupidity in this long unbroken chain. <sighs> Before we move on, since we've been talking a lot about cows as commodities, I'd like to take a moment for us to remember that cows are living beings who are sentient and conscious. They are capable of feeling pain, both physical and emotional, and in the right circumstances, capable of feeling pleasure and joy. And anyone who is bonded with a cat or a dog knows that all of this is true for cats and dogs. And it's also true of cows and of animals in general. So I'd like to share a moment of quiet empathy for every cow who is forcibly and artificially impregnated so that she can produce milk and then has her babies stolen from her soon after she gives birth because, you know, humans, they don't want her milk to be wasted on feeding her babies and who spends much of her life hooked up to milk sucking machines, which are uncomfortable and can even be quite painful, and who will be killed for hamburger meat when her milk production declines, which is usually when she's only about one quarter of the age that she would live to if she was not killed. Let's also have a moment of empathy for her babies, who experience traumatic separation from their mother, and then if they're female, suffer the same fate as their mother. And if they're male, are turned into veal while well, they're still babies, which involves a very horrible life living in a crate. May we work towards liberation for all, human and non-human alike. Okay, so getting back on topic, privatization is, to put it, you know, politely, uh, an extremely flawed method for protecting natural resources. What about Hardin's other suggestion for how to protect natural resources, which is to appoint an all-powerful manager, and most people interpret that as control by the state. When a state owns and controls a resource, this can take two very different forms. So one form that it takes is a state-owned and state-run company that turns the resource into a product for consumers. So like, for example, a water utility company that purifies the water and delivers it to every home and building in the city. In many cities, these water utility companies are owned and operated by the government. And speaking of water utility companies, I recently opened my water bill and electricity bill at the same time. I was shocked. Shocked, I tell you. I'm sorry. <laughs> but state ownership and control of a resource usually takes another form, which is that the state is not actually directly involved in using or harvesting the resource, but instead this is done by private companies or in some cases by individuals who are using the resource for subsistence. And the government's role in this situation is to make and enforce laws to ensure that the resource is used sustainably or, you know, at least that's the theory. <laughs> so for example, let's say the government owns a forest, but then it leases the right to cut down trees from that forest to logging companies. And then it sets rules and regulations for those companies to follow. And uh, supposedly it will also like catch and punish those companies if they break those laws. So the fact that this method of resource management is all about like the state making laws and punishing those who break them is why Garrett Hardin compared this method of resource management to the concept of the Leviathan. And uh, here's what he said about that in his article published in Wildlife and America. This is what the 17th century philosopher Thomas Hobbes wrote about in his book Leviathan, which was his name for the force by which a community of men must be governed precisely because individual consciences are not enough. So to better illustrate this uh, statist strategy of resource management, 
let's once again for like the seventh or 17th or 70th time use Hardin's tragedy of the commons parable as an example. So as usual, it starts with the tragedy of the common scenario with people adding too many cows and overgrazing the pasture. But then the state steps in and passes laws to prevent overgrazing. Perhaps the law says that each villager can only own one cow, or perhaps the state creates a limited number of permits, and then people have to buy a permit in order to get permission to graze a cow. And, you know, by limiting the number of permits, the state can then limit the number of cows that are grazing on the pasture. In any case, anyone who breaks the new law is forced to pay a fine. And this changes everything because now the villagers no longer have an incentive to add extra cows. Because now, however much money they might have gotten from adding an extra cow is going to be less than the amount of money they have to pay for paying the fine. So their financial incentive for adding the extra cow is gone. So as a result, the pasture will now be used sustainably. Or so the story goes. But wait a minute. As Ostrom points out in her book, the state won't be able to enforce its laws with perfect accuracy. There will be times when people break the law without being caught. And if the risk of getting caught is low enough, then that means that the rewards of breaking the rules are going to outweigh the risks. And then bam, the incentive to add extra cows is back. So basically that whole issue that we just described uh, can probably be summed up as imperfect enforcement, right? Enforcement of the rules or laws that the state creates is never going to be perfect. There's always going to be those who slip by undetected. And another issue that relates to this method of resource management is the cost of enforcement. Enforcement of these laws is not free because the government has to hire monitors. And by monitors, I mean people who, well, you know, they, they monitor to make sure that the laws are being followed. They monitor the resource users to make sure that they're not breaking the rules. So there's really a dilemma here when it comes to the cost of enforcing rules, because on the one hand, you don't want the cost of enforcing these laws to be too high. But if the government tries to cut these costs, then that will mean that either there will be too few monitors, which means that too many rule breakers will just go undetected, or it could also be that there are enough monitors, but they're just like so badly underpaid that they're tempted to accept bribes. And then that's going to like cause dysfunction and corruption within the system. And as an example of what I'm talking about here, Ostrom notes that there are many national parks or nature reserves, which, uh, you know, their stated goal is to protect wildlife and biodiversity, but they just totally fail in their goal of this. And as she puts it, Too many co-managed paper parks have been drafted in the home office of an overseas donor or even in a country's capital city only to be destroyed by illegal harvesting in the specified territory. Simply employing a few guards who cannot get to know the terrain or the people living in an area has not been a successful strategy. And when it comes to the state making laws to protect natural resources, there's another thing that can go wrong, which is that the state can be like just too heavy handed in its enforcement. You know, it can be just like overly punitive to resource users or just like invest way too much money in enforcement. And honestly, this is like pretty rare. And when it's done, it's usually against like, unfortunately, against subsistence resource users, you know, just like indigenous people or peasants or whatever who are like, you know, they're not trying to like make a bunch of profit or something like that to buy their fifth mansion or some shit. They're just like trying to get by and to live. Um, I've really yet to hear of cases where the state is overly punitive towards corporations or like, you know, big companies or anything like that. It's usually the fucking opposite situation for that. And actually, this is an advantage that resource users have over the state when it comes to managing a resource effectively and efficiently. In most commons, the resource users not only make their own rules, they also enforce them. And they tend to do a better job than the state does. They're not negligent. They're not too punitive. They get the balance right. The advantage comes from the fact that the resource users are, uh, to state the obvious, using the resource. So it's usually pretty easy for them to keep an eye on each other. And that basically takes care of the cost of monitoring. They don't have to hire other people to be monitors because they're just out there using the resource. They see each other using it. They can just keep an eye on each other as they go about their daily business and their daily use of the resource. Monitoring is kind of like just an automatic result 
from them just being the people who use the fucking resource. It just happens on its own. And likewise, because the resource is so important to their livelihood, they have a very, very strong incentive to make sure that monitoring and enforcement is done well. But when the state hires employees to be monitors, then those employees just don't have really any natural incentive to do their job well. And they don't have any incentives not to take bribes. You know, their intrinsic motivation is just absent. Well, unless they have, I don't know, maybe they have intrinsic motivation because they actually care about like nature not being destroyed. But like, you know, in terms of their own immediate self-interest, they don't have any intrinsic motivation. A regulatory agency always needs to hire its own monitors. The regulatory agency then faces the principal agent problem of how to ensure that its monitors do their own job. So to summarize, when the government makes a law to protect a natural resource, this does not automatically solve the problem that the law is meant to solve. Because compliance with the law needs to be monitored and enforced, and that takes money and resources and time and effort, and even then it probably won't be enforced with perfect accuracy. Now you would think that all of this would just be like pretty damn obvious, but Ostrom says that when people advocate state control as the solution to the tragedy of the commons, they just really don't take these factors into account. Rules must be enforced, but the question of how rules will actually be enforced is frequently ignored when a reform is proposed. The advice to centralize control is based on assumptions that the central agency monitors all actions of resource users costlessly and imposes sanctions correctly. So when it comes to this method of resource management, there are quite a few complicating factors. Uh, we've talked about the cost of enforcing rules. We've talked about difficulties with the accuracy of enforcing rules. And there's also the challenge of creating rules that are actually any good. If the rules are not good, if the rules are in fact quite bad, then even if you enforce them with perfect accuracy, it doesn't matter because enforcing bad rules is not helpful. Like in the state of Michigan, there's a law against tying an alligator to a fire hydrant. And even if that law is like enforced with 100% accuracy, I don't think it's doing anyone any good. What, am I supposed to bring my alligator into the store with me? Or just like leave them untied to wander the street? That doesn't seem responsible. What makes a rule good or bad can change depending on circumstances. Rules that work really, really well in one place are not necessarily gonna work somewhere else because rules need to be suitable and compatible to the local conditions and circumstances. Like rules that are good at protecting a forest or a pasture or a lake in one place are not necessarily going to be any good at protecting a forest or pasture or a lake that is located somewhere else. And the reason for that is because there can be like very vast differences in the local ecology or in the culture or economy of the local communities that use that resource. Now, to be totally fair, uh, all of these issues and challenges that a state faces when managing the use of resources, these are also issues and challenges that people face when managing their use of resources in a commons. However, even though they face the same challenges, there are reasons why the state might be particularly bad at handling these challenges successfully. And this is one of the points that Ostra makes. She says that the state tends to lack vital information about local conditions, information that is relevant to the natural resources that it is trying to protect, or supposedly trying to protect. One could certainly argue how hard it's trying to protect these resources, but there are important details about the local ecology, about the forests, the pasture land, the lakes, the fisheries, and so on, that the government just doesn't know or understand. And the government also doesn't know or understand details about the economy and culture of local communities that use these resources. Government bureaucrats can be quite clueless about these things because they work in an office and live in a city that is far away from the resources that they are trying to manage. No matter how many textbooks they read or how many professional development seminars they attend, their knowledge is always gonna have missing pieces, right? Because they don't know the specific details and unique circumstances of a forest and the community surrounding it that are like a hundred miles from their office. But the people who use the resource often do know these details because to once again state the obvious, the people who use a resource are the ones who actually use the resource. For years, they have interacted with the forest. As children, they played in it. 
As adults, they harvest wood from it to heat their homes and cook their food. They spent their life observing its patterns and cycles of growth and change. They are intimately familiar with it. And likewise, they understand the culture and economy of local communities because they're the ones who live in those communities. But this understanding is going to be lacking from a central authority or distant bureaucracy. Besides Ostrom, another person who makes this point is James C. Scott, a professor at Yale University who specializes in anthropology and political science. In his book, Seeing Like a State, Scott analyzes various cases where governments try to improve society, but failed spectacularly, spectacularly, <laughs> failed even worse than my attempt to say that word, apparently. We're talking about levels of failure even worse than I have achieved. Impressive. These are cases where a government implemented plans created by professionals and experts, but still those plans crashed and burned. As Scott writes, The great leap forward in China, collectivization in Russia, and compulsory villagization in Tanzania, Mozambique, and Ethiopia are among the great human tragedies of the 20th century. In terms of both lives lost and lives irretrievably disrupted, at a less dramatic but far more common level, the history of third world development is littered with the debris of huge agricultural schemes in new cities, think of Brasilia or Chandigarh, that have failed their residents. So yeah, these failures are like so bad that even someone like me can feel good by comparison. I mean, my life is a barren wasteland of broken dreams. I will admit to that. But at least that barren wasteland never caused a famine, which is a lot more than can be said for some of these cases. A few pages later, Scott sums up his argument for why efforts like this have tended to fail. He says that schematic authoritarian solutions to production and social order inevitably fail when they exclude the fund of valuable knowledge embodied in local practices. Excluding valuable knowledge found in local practices is why central bureaucracies can be so clueless. Now, this point about the cluelessness of central bureaucracies is a point that is often brought up by people who think that private ownership and private management are superior to state ownership and state management. But it's like really funny that they think this point is good ammo for their pro-privatization position because the same point can just be turned back around against them. I mean, these accusations of the incompetence of central authorities and distant bureaucracies like, it doesn't just apply to governments. Any large company is also going to be a central authority with a distant bureaucracy. And distance is not the only issue. I mean, even a local government can be pretty clueless. Like, there might be government offices that are only a five-minute walk from an inshore fishery, but what do the politicians and bureaucrats who work in that office actually know about that fishery? Probably not more than the people who actually use it to fish for a living. You know, these, these politicians and bureaucrats might not be distant in geography, but they are distant in experience. And speaking of fisheries, one of the comments that Ostrom discusses in her book is a fishery in Sri Lanka on the beaches of a village called Mowali, though it's probably pronounced quite differently than that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about this case because it's a good example of what we've been talking about regarding the importance of of having knowledge of local conditions. Okay, so the fishers in this village fish with what is called a beach seine, which is a type of fishing net. And two things about these nets are that, one, each net is not owned by one fisher, but co-owned by a group of fishers. And two, these nets are enormous. And when I say that these nets are enormous, I really, really mean it. Each net is half a mile long, and the beach is only big enough for two nets to be used at a time. Because of this, the fishers are not able to fish every day or even every week. They have to take turns. And the fact that they had to take turns means that they had to figure out how this turn taking would be structured, right? Like what should the rules about turn taking be? So what they came up with is that first of all, they divided the beach into two different sites, each which is capable of fitting just one enormous net. One site is called the harbor side because it's got a harbor, and the other is called the rock side, uh, presumably because it has a lot of rocks, or maybe because it's where people like to smoke rocks a crack. I don't know. 
Um, or it could be that that's where grannies like to rock in their rocking chairs while smoking rocks a crack. Yeah, that's probably it. It's a good time. Better than being drowned in a shallow pool of baby's blood. <laughs> Whatever the case, each side of the beach has a rotation of a few nets per day, one after the other. Now, for those who co-own a fishing net, which side of the beach their net launches from is not the same every day. And likewise, what time of day they can use their net is not the same every day either. It's a rotation system where the time and place that a net gets its turn is constantly shifting. You can get an idea of the rotation system by looking at this chart. Each letter of the alphabet represents a different net. And uh, this is actually a simplified version of how the rotation system works. In practice, the number of nets in use from each side of the beach varies from day to day. So these rotation rules were created by the fishers themselves, but why did they make the rules so complicated? Why didn't they just create a simple rotation system? The reason is because a simple rotation system would not give each fishing net an equal opportunity to catch fish. The complex rotation system that they came up with is what's needed to provide equal fish catching opportunity and to provide equal opportunity to sell the fish in the local market when the price is highest. There are four reasons why this is and Ostrom explains them in her book, so I'm gonna just let her do the explaining for me. One, the harbor side produces the really big catches, but the rock side is more consistently productive when there are fewer fish. Two, the first catch of the morning is most likely to be the biggest catch of the day, and the prices are highest in the morning. 3. The weather affects the number of hauls that can be made in the day, and any system assigning a set hour of the day would be inefficient. 4. Beach seining involves high labor inputs to prepare a net for use and to restack it afterward, and simple rotation systems allowing all nets to be used only once per rotation would involve higher labor cost. Okay, so I'm not really sure if that was clear or confusing, but you don't really need to understand their exact reasons for making the rules as they did. The point is that the rules are adapted to local conditions and local circumstances. The geography, the patterns of weather, the migratory patterns of the fish, the details about the fishing technology, even just the hour to hour fluctuations in the market prices. All of these things need to be taken into consideration when making the rules and policies for this particular fishery. And that's pretty much how it always is, right? Detailed knowledge of local conditions is important for creating optimal policies. And this detailed knowledge is something that the local people who use a resource tend to have, and it's something that the bureaucrats in government offices tend to lack. So when a state blunders its attempts to manage a resource, this lack of knowledge is often at least part of the reason for its failure. And Ostrom's book has case studies that demonstrate this, like, for example, the attempts by the government in the Philippines to manage irrigation systems. When external experts working without the participation of the irrigators have designed irrigation systems with the primary aim of achieving technical efficiency, they frequently have failed to achieve either the hoped for technical efficiency or the level of organized action required to allocate water in a regular fashion or to maintain the physical system itself. So as you can see, when it comes to state management of natural resources, there are some serious problems, but we haven't even looked at the full picture. So far, we've been assuming that the government is making an honest effort to manage natural resources in a way that is sustainable. We've been assuming that the government is making an honest effort to prevent ecological damage. But that's like assuming that, well, if you've heard the expression, letting the fox guard the hen house, well, I mean, you might as well just assume that the fox is going to make an honest effort to guard those hens. Earlier, we discussed how the profit motive can lead to the destruction of natural resources, a truly dire problem. But it's not just private companies that are under the corrupting influence of the profit motive. The state is under that influence, too. You can't really rely on a government to adequately regulate companies when the people who run that government are being legally bribed by the owners of those companies that they're supposed to be regulating. You know, campaign donations, lobbying, the revolving door of career opportunities between government and corporations. And often if you look at the stock portfolios that are owned by politicians and other high up members of government, 
they're actually profiting off of the very industries that they're supposed to be regulating. You might say that there's like a conflict of interest between their role as profiteers and their role as public servants, but I mean, that's not really a conflict of interest, you know? It's more like a straight up massacre because that profiteering interest just straight fucking slaughters the public interest. Anyone who pays attention to the actions of government will see the same pattern over and over in country after country. Governments tend to serve the interests of capitalists or, you know, businesses and the rich. I'm not saying that they're doing this in every single decision, but in the balance of things, that is the pattern. And arguably, actually, that's always their motive, that like even when they're helping the working class, that it's really just about making things more stable for the capitalist class. But that's a whole other discussion. So eh, never mind, we're not going to get into that. That's for another video. Anyways, but in the balance of things, governments are serving corporations and the rich. And what do corporations and the rich want? Obviously, they want to make lots of profit, so governments try to support that goal. It's no surprise that when governments create laws to protect natural resources or protect the environment, those laws tend to be weak as fuck. Businesses generally face very loose restrictions, very loose monitoring, and if they're actually caught breaking environmental law, they tend to face very weak punishments, basically just like a slap on the wrist that even a mosquito could survive. So as far as I know, there has not yet been a large-scale study that examines resources that are managed by resource users in a commons, resources that are managed by private owners, and resource users that are managed by a state, and then done a comparison of these three methods of resource management on a scale that spans multiple countries and multiple types of resources. I searched and searched and could not find anything like that. However, smaller scale studies have been done for like particular resources in particular countries. And generally the results of these studies seem to validate that management of resources by resource users of a commons is a good way to go. And a few of these studies are mentioned in an article from 2018 published in the Journal of Institutional Economics. In many instances, user self-governance has proven to be a much more powerful solution than statist and privatization efforts have. For example, Ostrom, Lamb, and Lee, 1994, and Shivakoti and Ostrom, 2002, showed credibly that farmer-managed irrigation schemes in Nepal outperformed state-run schemes. And Anderson and Ostrom, 2008, reported similar findings from a comparative study of forestry management regimes in Bolivia. Speaking of Nepal, this country has another case worth mentioning, uh, this one in the management of forests, which people in the villages of Nepal used to get firewood and to graze their animals. And they had been doing this for centuries without causing any problems. Uh, but then in the 20th century, the population of Nepal began rising and rising, and this increased the pressure on the forests, and by the 1970s, Nepal had a deforestation crisis. And this crisis was occurring despite efforts by the government to stop it. And these efforts included uh, restricting people's use of the forests, demanding that people have a permit to take anything from forests, and then punishing anyone who broke the rules. But all of this wasn't working, right? The deforestation just kept getting worse and worse. So eventually the government switched strategies and decided to hand over management of the forests to community forest groups. In other words, the government was encouraging the people who used resources from the forest to be the ones to manage the forest themselves, right? It was self-governance of the commons. And what was the result? The result of this community-led management, recent NASA-funded research has found, was a near doubling of forest cover in the small mountainous country. The maps above show forest cover in Nepal in 1992, the top, and 2016, at the bottom. Between these years, forest cover in the country almost doubled, from 26% to 45%. And in addition to the forests regrowing, there were benefits for the people who were using the forests. Their incomes increased and they had better food security. And there's also been other studies that have shown that when people work together to self-govern their use of a forest, it has positive outcomes. For example, a research study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences found that local autonomy in rulemaking for use of a forest 
leads to that forest having increased carbon storage. And other research published in the mid and late 1990s has found huge differences in the degradation of pasture lands based on whether it's a common pasture, a state-managed pasture, or private pasture. And this was revealed by satellite images comparing pasture land that was found in southern Siberia, in northern China, and in Mongolia. And so it's not like they compared every bit of pasture land in all three countries. Uh, they were looking at an area of pasture land that was in a spot where all three countries were meeting at the border. So it's like a big area of pasture land that is just, you know, divided by these artificial borders. So it was all like in the same region. So the climate, the geography was very, very similar. The only real significant difference was like the different types of management that it was being subjected to. In southern Siberia, about three quarters of pasture land is degraded. And this is in a region where the government had imposed state-owned agriculture collectives. And in northern China, about one third of pasture land is degraded. And here, the government had also imposed state-owned agriculture collectives. And then later, it privatized the pastures by dividing them into plots of land for each household. And finally, in Mongolia, only one-tenth of pasture land is degraded. And in this case, the pasture land is a commons and is managed by the indigenous pastoralists who use it. So at least in this case, a state managing state property and private owners managing private property are both associated with more degradation than resource users managing a commons. But of course, there are also cases where management by the state or management by private owners is going to outperform management by resource users. And I think it's only fair to admit that just as local resource users have the advantage of having detailed knowledge about local conditions, that the state and private companies, they also have an advantage of their own. And that advantage is having access to enormous fucking piles of money. And they can use these enormous fucking piles of money for advanced information gathering. Because even though local resource users have information that can only really be gained from experience of using the resource and from having proximity to the resource, this is not always enough. It's like the example I gave earlier about the underground water reservoir. It's essential to know the sustainable extraction rate, right? Like how much water you can take from the reservoir without gradually depleting it and then eventually running out of water, which would fucking suck. If people don't know the sustainable extraction rate, then their attempts to manage the use of that water reservoir are probably going to fail because they just don't know what limits to set on their use of that water. But to find out the sustainable extraction rate for any particular water reservoir, that's going to require extensive research using high-tech equipment and professional expertise. And funding this research requires, you guessed it, an enormous fucking pile of money. Unfortunately, an enormous fucking pile of money is something that most people do not have. And, you know, even if like all the local resource users come together and combine their small piles of money, it just might not be enough. Money can buy access to high tech equipment and to the people who know how to use it. But does it have to be this way? Could we possibly create an economic system where access to these things does not require enormous fucking piles of money or even any money at all? a system where these things would be freely available to anyone in need? And could all of this be done without private companies, without profit, and crucially, without a state? My personal opinion is that the answer to these questions is yes. And if you'd like a detailed explanation of why that is true, or well, why I believe it is true at least, you can check out my video, Post-Capitalism, A Detailed Look at How It Could Work, which you can find linked down below in the video description. Or, you know, just, look through the videos on my channel. It's there. Maybe you'll find something else you like to watch. Wee! I don't know why I did that voice. I, I think I think I've been filming too long and I'm feeling fucking giddy in the head. It's making me a bit crazy. It's making me kind of crazy. Okay, <laughs> that's enough. That's enough. That's enough. That's enough. Enough nonsense. But anyways, all of that, of course, is just speculation about future possibilities. And right now, here we are stuck in the miserable present. And if you don't have enormous fucking piles of money, then you cannot afford to buy access to the technology and expertise that are sometimes needed for proper resource management. And that fucking sucks. The expertise that resource users have of their local environment and local community is one type of expertise. 
And then the expertise that academics and professionals have is another type of expertise. In a better world that had like a better, smarter, more rational political and economic system, both types of expertise would team up to empower more effective self-governance of society and the economy. But as it stands, these types of expertise are separated and alienated from each other. Though actually it's a lot worse even than that, because as it stands, we have the worst of both worlds. The policy decisions made by governments tend to ignore both the expertise of local resource users and the expertise of experts and professionals and academics and so on. You know, unless those so-called experts are like hand-picked sycophantic yes-men who've like sold their soul and sold out their professional credibility in exchange for a cushy fucking career, but... That's a whole other story. So those are some critiques of putting natural resources under the dominion of the state or private companies. Though honestly, if you want like the best critique of all, just take a look around and ask yourself, hmm, how has this been working out so far? Forests are vanishing, cut down to stumps or burned to ash. The soil, which grows our food, is degrading. Pasture land is degrading. Fish populations are declining. Biodiversity is disappearing. Species are going extinct. Their wild habitat is destroyed or paved over. Even drinkable water is becoming scarce, and it keeps getting scarcer. You think it hurts being thirsty when you scroll Instagram? <laughs> Just wait, honey. Soon this whole world will be a thirst trap. And I think that'll feel considerably worse. The scale of damage to the environment is so bad that it really just cannot possibly be the result of sincere attempts at environmental protection and sustainability that, despite everyone's earnest efforts, just happen to fail. At least not in most cases. You know, not saying that's never ever happened, but... It's definitely not the trend, definitely not the pattern. So no, the crisis that the environment is in is not a mistake, it's not the result of people trying but screwing up, it's a result of a system-wide conflict of interest with the environment. And that conflict of interest is profit. And our economic system also has another feature that puts it at odds with the environment, and that is capitalism's requirement for infinite economic growth. You know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist or, well, actually I should say an environmental scientist to realize that infinite growth on a finite planet is a fantasy. A fantasy so stupid and absurd that only an economist could believe it. Some people are really fucking stupid. But it's a fantasy that the governments of the world are willing to play along with. It's clear that the kind of people who wind up in charge of governments don't give a damn about the horrendously harmful things that are being done to nature, or to other species, or even to our own fucking species. They prove this year after year after year with their actions and their inactions. And honestly, even the people in charge of government who do give a damn, few and far between as they are, they're not really going to have a chance to do the good that they might actually want to do because this... The system is just set up to block them every step of the way. Both private ownership and control and state ownership and control are ruinous. Both systems ravenously deplete resources, working together to ruin the planet while enriching the rich. This is the problem. This is what's driving us to ruin. And if they continue to drive us down this path, it won't be long before even the rich will suffer terribly and die in droves because... Nobody is immune from the consequences of global and ecological collapse. So it's very clear that I'm not exactly a fan of either state or private ownership and control of natural resources. But let's be real, it's not necessarily a good situation just because a natural resource is shared as a commons and governed by the people who use it. And it's not just that resource users can do a bad job of managing a commons, uh, though they certainly can. It's also because there are some commons where this management is done in a way where some of the resource users are excluded, or where some of the resource users have 
more power and control than others. To give you an example, here is a quote from an article that was published in the journal Current Research in Environmental Sustainability. Moodliar and Kuntz, 2018, show that the processes of domination and oppression, e.g. practices in India of caste-based untouchability and discrimination, continue to structure village life as well as the interactions of members in the context of the commons. Yet, the approval of local leaders from the so-called higher castes is necessary to secure or maintain access to benefits or avoid additional costs that these powerful leaders could impose in other social and administrative settings. And this problem is also mentioned in an article published in the International Journal of the Commons, which says, However much common property norms might appear to be fair, many traditional communities are shot through with layers of hierarchy, and especially with norms about gender roles. Unfortunately, some of the commons that Ostrom discusses in her book have inequality and exclusion woven into their system of governance. For example, she discusses several communities in Spain where the farmers govern the local irrigation systems. And one of those communities has a rule that unless you own at least 1.8 hectares of land, then you can't even participate in governing the irrigation system. <laughs> Fucking awful, right? And this is a community where like two thirds of the farmers own less than one hectare of land. And since the minimum to govern the commons is 1.8 hectares, that means that most of the farmers in this community are not allowed to participate in governing their own irrigation system. So it's like, excuse me, but what the actual fuck? What kind of garbage is that? Thankfully, of all the communities in Spain with a common irrigation system, only one of those communities has any ridiculous rules like this. But, you know, still, the, the fact that it's even one community is still fucked up. It, it hurts me to be telling you all this, honestly. When I decided to do this video, I was just like hoping to give a totally unambiguously positive report about the commons and how it's like just always this perfect picture of egalitarianism, non-hierarchical self-governance and blah, blah, blah. Everyone just sharing and managing things as perfect equals. But reality is what it is, and facts don't care about my feelings. I'll give you that much, Ben Shapiro. Though, honestly, you could really take your own advice on that, bro. But anyways, point is that the commons cannot be idealized or romanticized, because they're not always as egalitarian or democratic as they might seem. It's sad, but true. However, I really don't want to give you the impression that it is just like the norm for commons to be shitty and hierarchical and non-egalitarian. Many commons that exist in the world are really and truly egalitarian. And even when they're not, they at least have the potential to be. And this potential is very much not present anytime the state or private companies are in control. When that happens, all hope for egalitarianism withers and dies. So we are in desperate need of alternatives to capitalism and the state. We need new economic and political systems, systems that will support us in our efforts to heal the harm that we've caused to the environment, to heal the harm that we've caused to each other and to ourselves, and to stop the destruction of life. And by alternatives to capitalism, I'm not talking about like some bullshit fake socialism that is found in like, I don't know, Sweden or China or the former Soviet Union, all of that should be rejected, in my opinion at least. Instead of power structures where an elite few get to be the decision makers for society, we should create egalitarian power structures where people have decision making power over the issues that impact their lives. And also, we should create a system where the wealth of the world is shared by all, whether that wealth comes from nature or from technology or from knowledge. All of it should be shared in a way that is egalitarian. Okay, thank you for listening to my wish list of a future society, or at least an excerpt from that wish list. It gets much longer, trust me. But I describe all of this to make a point, which is that this is why, in my opinion, the research that Ostrom and her colleagues have done on the commons is so important. Because although it is not like definitive proof 
that a society like the one that I wish for is possible, it does help lend evidence to the case that it is. And making that case is like pretty much my entire goal of life. So thank you, Eleanor Ostrom. I appreciate you. Now, I know that in this video, I haven't given much attention to the actual process of governing or managing a commons, like how this is actually done, and how it can be done successfully in a way that is egalitarian. But that will be given attention in my next video, which will go into quite a lot of detail to explain some research proven tips on how people can self-govern and self-manage a commons and do so successfully. And this information is extremely important, right? Because this is exactly the type of information that we need if we want to create a society that is actually egalitarian and not just talk about it. I know that all I do is talk about it, but <laughs> I hope that one day we can actually put this into action. Yay! And besides that, it's also the type of knowledge that we will need if climate change and other environmental catastrophes cause governments to collapse and economic supply chains to collapse. Because if that happens, we're going to find ourselves in a position where we have to get together with other people in our neighborhood and in nearby communities and figure out together how we're going to manage economic resources. Just saying, might, might be kind of useful to know how to cooperate with thousands of people to collectively share and manage resources. You know, that is if you're a fan of surviving uh, and also a fan of thriving. Personally, I'm a fan of surviving and thriving, so I'm hoping we can figure this all out. Okay, so before we wrap up this video for realsies, let's just do like a quick one minute review of four key points so that even if you forget everything else, these are the four main things to remember. One, the tragedy of the commons is not the usual outcome of a commons, at least not in cases where a commons is governed or managed by the resource users and is a limited commons rather than an open access commons. In these cases, tragic outcomes are the exception rather than the rule. Two, natural resources are being overused, degraded, and depleted all around the world. And this is largely due to the fact that these resources are managed by commercial enterprises and by states. And a lot of this has to do with the corrupting influence of the profit motive. Three, as the research of Ostrom and others have shown, there are countless examples of successful commons. And in many of these commons, people share and manage resources in a way that is highly egalitarian. And finally, number four, these practices of self-governance and egalitarianism have been scaled up to encompass large numbers of people, tens of thousands. And so perhaps they can be scaled way, way up to create an egalitarian society and egalitarian world. Hello, 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 everyone. Thank you for watching this video all the way to the end like a fucking champ. And if you would like to support me in continuing to make videos like this, I would really, really appreciate that because they are a lot of work and living in this world ain't free. So you can support me with monthly donations at patreon.com slash one lucky black cat. Or if you'd rather not donate monthly and just want to drop me a one-time gift, you can do that at PayPal or also through Ko-Fi or Coffee or whatever the hell it's called. Links are in the video description and also on my YouTube channel. And you can also help in non-financial ways just by like sharing my videos or telling people about my channel through good old fashioned word of mouth. It also helps with the algorithm just to be like watching my videos. So you could just like break into a bunch of different people's homes and like, you know, go to their laptops or computers and just like go to YouTube and just start like playing my videos on like multiple computers and laptops across multiple homes. You know, that's, that's if you're a real ride or die supporter. <laughs> I always love it when people commit crimes to support my channel. Of course, I'm only kidding because YouTube, I think, will delete channels uh, if you like uh, recommend that people do crimes or encourage illegal activity. So it's only a joke. Oh, I have a weird twitch in my eye. I'm sorry. And if you haven't already watched it, you might want to check out the video I released just before this one. It's looking at like how people being dispossessed of common land and common resources has enabled economic exploitation. And this is a process that has occurred throughout history 
and even in prehistory. I'm currently hard at work on the next video. And as I mentioned, that video is going to give details on how people self-govern and self-manage a commons, looking at both successful and unsuccessful cases. So we can learn from what people do right and what they do wrong. Uh, you know, it's good to learn from mistakes. And it will show us real life examples of people sharing economic resources in a way that is egalitarian and managing these resources collectively using non-hierarchical and bottom-up management practices. And finally, if you hate capitalism and you also hate the state-dominated alternatives to capitalism that have been tried in the past and wrongly labeled as socialist or communist, and if you hate all systems that involve dominance hierarchy and exploitation, and if you hate all the useless goddamn fucking suffering and wasted potential that this is causing to human beings and to all the beautiful beings that we share this beautiful planet with, and if you would love it if humanity would try something new and different and better than all this, something that would help to bring out the best of our potential. And I don't mean some like fairy tale like, oh, if we just had a certain system, we'd all be fucking angels. No, but like some systems do help to bring out a worse side of who we are and other systems are going to help bring out a better side of who we are. We still have to do the fucking work, but you have something pushing you more in one direction or the other. And I think we should have a system that pushes us in a good fucking direction. Then you might like to check out my video, Post-Capitalism, a detailed look at how it could work. A link can be found in the video description and an image link can also be found on the screen in the last 20 seconds of this video, which is about to start right now. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.